I just need them to accept that they're in love. I am a prophet. What? <laughs> what? It's finally time. Today is a day that we have been waiting for for nearly two years. Chain of Thorns, the conclusion to the Last Hours series, the sequel to the Infernal Devices series, is finally here. I am woefully unprepared. So, if you're here, you've probably already seen my first two reading blogs for Chain of Gold and Chain of Iron. I read those two books right as they came out and I made full long reading blogs for them going through all of my emotions and all of my thoughts and of course I had to make a reading blog for the final book in the series because not only is this series ending but the series of vlogs are also ending which makes me so emotional because these have been so much fun for me to make. Truly some of my favorite videos I've ever made have been my last hour's reading vlog. So I'm very excited to film this video but it's also really bittersweet because it's the end of so many things and I don't do well with endings, okay? Like that's one thing you need to know about me, I do not do well with endings. So this it's gonna be rough. <laughs> I mentioned this at the beginning of all of these videos because it's probably the most frequently asked question when it comes to the Shadowhunter books, but people always ask what order do you have to read the books in. My personal recommendation, as I always say, is to read them in publication order. That's the way that I've read them and I also think it is probably the most enjoyable way to read them. However, if you don't want to read all of them because I know it's a lot of books and they're really long, what I would definitely recommend is read the Infernal Devices series, which is one of my all-time favorite series anyway. You should just read it. It's fantastic. Read the Infernal Devices series, then read this series. That will give you the baseline of what you need to understand this series. You can technically read it on its own, but I would not recommend it because you'll be spoiled for that whole series. So if you don't want to be spoiled for this series or the Infernal Devices, then just click out of this video right now, go read the books, go watch the other two videos, and then come back here and suffer along with me. So I did not reread Chain of Thorns and Chain of Iron before reading this, so we're just gonna rely on my memory memory and also me having rewatched my reviews because that was the only thing that I did to prepare. But I think, I think I'm pretty solid. I have a fairly good memory of what happened in the series. She's really big, so I think this video is probably going to be absurdly long. But you know what? We're gonna keep it because I want it for the memories. I feel like I need to document every single second of this book, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I hope you enjoy the literal feature-length film that this video will inevitably be. Let's get started. That's. It sounds so weird to say that. We're just gonna start reading the last book in one of my all-time favorite series and then after this it's just gonna be over and then what am I supposed to do with myself? It's like ripping off a band-aid, right? We just have to get started. We have to get started. We have to go through the pain in order to get to the happy ending. Okay, that's enough stalling. Let's get started. Oh my god, I forgot to show you all how prepared I am. I have a chain of thorns blanket. I prepared tabs that will match the cover of the book. So I'm like fully ready to dive into this, even though I'm completely not ready at all. I wish I didn't have to read this. <laughs> okay, so I have officially started reading. I am 55 pages? Yes, 55 pages into the book right now. Let's do like a quick recap of kind of where we left off on Chain of Iron and where we're at now. So basically, end of Chain of Iron, we had Belial stealing Tatiana from the Citadel. She was supposed to be imprisoned in the Citadel, but Belial came and just like kidnapped her from there. I guess not kidnapped her because she went willingly, but you know, just like stole her away. So now she's out and she's not in prison anymore. And I don't think anyone really knows that she's gone yet. The bracelet finally came off and James was basically about to confess to Cordelia that he has feelings for her but then Grace came in at that time and then Cordelia only overheard part of their conversation and misunderstood it as him saying that he was still in love with Grace so then she runs away runs to Matthew Matthew's like let's run away to Paris so then they basically are running off to Paris James finds out about this he goes after them he gets to the train they're already leaving and then Will shows up just then to tell him that Lucy is missing and Lucy Lucy's missing because she's with Malcolm Fade and Jesse because she resurrected Jesse and it made her lose like all of her energy so she had passed out and 
then they just took her away and they disappeared and we didn't know where they were. Cordelia also still has the like oath or something that she made with Lilith and so now she can't use Cortana. So that's like a whole problem. Obviously Belial's a whole problem. So we have like two major demons who are very big problems at present. And the book pretty much picks up right where we left off so far. It's mostly honestly just kind of been recapping what happened at the end of Chain of Iron. But basically what's happened so far is that James is with Will and Magnus and they are going after Lucy trying to find her. And Lucy is fine, she's just woken up. But Malcolm wants her to resurrect Annabelle, which if you've read the Dark Artifices series, you know what happens there. So I'm not really gonna get into it because I don't want to get into spoilers for the Dark Artifices. Yeah, so we have that connection which was obviously we learned some more about it in the last book as well but I'm curious to know if she is actually going to somehow summon Annabelle in any way and what influence that might have had on the events of the Dark Artifices. But yeah Jesse is like alive and well, he is up and walking and good, no longer a ghost. Grace is imprisoned basically in the Silent City and she's being questioned by the Silent Brothers. They want to know about her involvement with Tatiana and how much of a role she played in everything. And so Jem has been talking to her, but she's been doing tons of interrogations with the Silent Brothers. Honestly, I have to say, I watched back my previous reviews, like I mentioned earlier, and I like viscerally hated Grace. I remember why, obviously, because of what was happening in the books. But after reading Chain of Iron, after having like sat with it for almost two years now, and having started this now, I think I have a lot more sympathy for Grace's character. I don't don't condone her actions but she was just so deeply manipulated by Tatiana that I honestly can't blame her too much. If I were James I don't think I could ever forgive her because of how directly what she did impacted him and how it ruined his life in so many ways and took away his agency but as an observer I, I think I have more of an appreciation for Grace's character now than I did when I had first read Chain of Gold and while I was reading Chain of Iron I feel like now I can understand her a little bit better and I'm not like as angry at her but maybe if I were to like go back and reread those scenes the ones that made me really upset I would really hate her in those moments too but I also think her characterization is pretty complex because you do hate her but you also really do understand because you can recognize that she's also been severely manipulated even though there are some times where she really could have made different decisions but still she's been she's been basically groomed since she was a kid and that's really sad so yeah I think this time around I'm just not gonna have as much of a visceral reaction to everything that Grace does I mean it's also in part because she's taking accountability for her actions now and is confessing the truth to everyone now so it's gonna be a lot easier to like her I think but I just in general think I have just a deeper appreciation for her character than I used to which is good I think it'll make the reading experience more enjoyable and I can just focus my hatred on Tatiana and Belial <laughs> other things that have happened so far Christopher has been working on um, a way to send messages using runes. Ariadne discovered this letter that we don't know like what the contents of it is but she also discovered this piece of paper that had notes about the Herondales and Lightwoods keeping track of every wrongdoing they've ever done, any slight they've ever made against typically like members of the clave and her father was the one like keeping track of this. So we have to find out what's in that letter. And as for Matthew and Cordelia, they are in Paris dress shopping and currently they are going to a cabaret and I had to pause an update right here because they just mentioned that the person who's performing at the cabaret is Madame Dorothea like Madame Dorothea from the original Mortal Instruments series. We have not seen her since like City of Bones. I was not expecting that. I have to keep going to see where this goes. I love when we have references to the old series. It's so much fun. That's why I love reading these books so much because they're so interconnected. But yeah, that's pretty much all we have going on so far. Cordelia and James have been very angsty. They've been having nightmares about each other and I just need them to reunite and I need everything to be sorted out because I love of angst I really do but we've had two very long books full of angst and I know this is gonna be another very long book full of a lot of angst but I would also like some resolution and some happiness <laughs> Matthew just confessed that he loves Cordelia to Cordelia no, no. 
what did I say when I was reading Chain of Iron? What did I say? I Listen, he just said that he has wanted to kiss her this entire time because she asked, why have you not kissed me? And he was like, do you think I have not wanted to kiss you? I have wanted to kiss you every moment of every day. I've held myself back and I always will unless you tell me I no longer need to do so. And she says, I would like you to kiss me. And he says, Daisy, don't joke. They're about to kiss and I promise you, James is about to walk in. James is about to walk in and he's gonna see it. That's literally what I said was gonna happen at the end of Chain of Iron, but instead they just ran away to Paris. It's happening now. Give me like one page and it's about to happen. They kissed and I don't wanna be here. I've said this in every single one of these reviews, but I love Matthew so much. I love Cordelia so much. I love James so much. I love all of them so much, but I don't want this love triangle. It's only going to end in pain for Matthew. I'm convinced that Matthew is going to die by the end of the series because he's not on that horrible family tree that we cannot trust at all. It's strange that he's not on it. There has to be either he dies or there has to be some other weird crazy reason why he's been just removed from the family tree. And so I'm just so concerned and I don't want this love triangle to be happening because I love all three of them so much, but James and Cordelia are meant to be with each other and this is only just gonna end in suffering and ugh, I can't deal with it. I just turned the page. What is this? What is this? First of all, I had no idea there were gonna be illustrations in this book. I'm getting a photo of Matthew and Cordelia kissing before I get James and Cordelia kissing. There were no illustrations in the other books, were there? Because I read the arcs, so they might have just been missing. Do I have to go back and look at my finished copies? Because I don't think there are illustrations in those. What is this? Thank God I didn't flip through it because I would have been spoiled. I, I can't even look at this. It feels wrong. It feels wrong. This is, it's blasphemous. I don't want it. Y'all are not meant to be together. I can't do this. Oh my God. I have to keep reading. No. What did I say? What did I say? Oh my God. I'm like literally tearing up. They're making out. They go back to the hotel. She's like, we have to go to the room. He's like, not my room. It's too messy. They go to her room. The lights are off. Then suddenly someone turned the lights on. And who's there? James. Why am I doing this to myself? My life would be so different if I didn't care about Hair and Daisy this much. But I do. I was gonna go to bed after this chapter. That's not happening now. <laughs> I knew this was coming. I've known since 2021, when the last book came out. I've known that this scene was going to happen. And yet, I am still an emotional wreck. I don't want it. I don't want it. I just want them to be happy. How many more times am I gonna have to say it until it becomes true? <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm so, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so overwhelmed. So James is there. He confronts Cordelia and Matthew. He's like, Cordelia, I hate Grace. I want nothing to do with her. And then what does Matthew say? He says, James, you didn't want her. Oh, that broke me. And he says, I was a fool. I freely admit that I was wrong about my own feelings. I was wrong about my marriage. I didn't think it was real. It was real, the most real thing in my life. And then he looks at Cordelia and says, I wish to repair the broken things to put them back together. I wish. And then she interrupts him and says, does it not matter what I wish? And she says, if I hurt you by coming here with Matthew, I'm sorry, but I did not think you would care. And then he says that he's been here for hours. And then he has this bottle that's basically like absinthe because Matthew's supposed to have been like sober this entire time. Like that was part of their promise of coming to Paris together, he would stay sober and Cordelia would just come with him so that she could forget everything that happened with James. And he has not been keeping that promise. He's been lying. So Cordelia finds out that he's been lying. Earlier too, James had realized that the bracelet was like dulling all of his emotions and all of his memories as well. So he wasn't able to fully be there for Matthew either. All those times where he had noticed Matthew's problem with alcohol and he wanted to say something, he wanted to confront him about it, he never fully did because the bracelet was dulling his emotions and holding him back. And so now I think he's like actually going to confront him finally and they're actually gonna have a like real conversation about his addiction. Cordelia gets obviously upset and she realizes that he's been lying this entire time and then she tells them both to stop because they're like fighting now and she tells them to like solve it between them and then she says it was a mistake to come to Paris with him and then walks out. Oh my god. I am stressed. <laughs> I need James and Matthew to sit down 
have a real conversation, him to tell Matthew, actually first I need James and Cordelia to sit down, have a real conversation and have him explain in detail what actually has happened to him and how he was being controlled by Grace and the bracelet and everything. Because right now it's way too vague and she's way too confused. And then I need him to sit down and have a conversation with Matthew and tell him the truth also. So both of them will have like the full story, the full picture and understand what was actually happening with him because right now it's it's just not clear enough so there's too much room for misinterpretation he is trying though he's like really trying to explain to them what actually happened but he's too mad understandably so because if i walked in on the girl i love and my best friend kissing i would be so pissed <laughs> he came here to tell her the truth and he's about to backtrack and just not tell her the truth he's literally just not even going to tell her about the grace thing because he doesn't think that it's believable like oh my god james please dear god i cannot handle this miscommunication just just tell her just tell her before i lose my mind <laughs> He didn't tell her. He didn't tell her and now I have to suffer through like 600 more pages of Cordelia just not knowing that James has just been manipulated and taken advantage of for years and years. She's just not gonna know and so now we have to suffer through this many more pages of it because he decided to be noble. Because <laughs> he wants her to make a free choice and I love him for it but I also hate him for it because I just want her to know. She deserves to know. Just tell her the truth. My god, I'm about to crawl into this book and do it myself. <laughs> okay, good morning. It's the next day. I'm currently 227 pages into the book, so I made this much progress. We still have like 500 pages to go. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the last thing I talked about was James, Matthew, and Cordelia having that conversation where James basically tells Cordelia that he loves her and she's like, how am I supposed to believe you because you've just been going back and forth between me and Grace and I don't understand. And he also talked to Matthew and Matthew and him are kind of in this weird place right now, but they both agreed that Cordelia is the one who gets to decide what she wants. And Matthew is also starting to fully acknowledge that he has a problem with alcohol. Pretty sure that's where I left off. After that, basically Magnus shows up and he's like, y'all need to get back to London because I need to tell everybody uh, what's been going on here because everything's a mess. So they come back and they meet with Will and Tessa as well. But basically Magnus explains that Tatiana has escaped from the Citadel with Belial and they don't know what's going on there. Also, I started listening to the audiobook for this one because I downloaded it before my book arrived because I was really impatient and I was worried that my book wasn't going to arrive on time yesterday and so I listened to like maybe 20 minutes of it yesterday and they pronounce his name as Belial or Belial and I've been saying Belial this entire time so I don't know what's accurate but I I'm still gonna call him Belial <laughs> also they butcher the Farsi in this book like every single time the narrator speaks Farsi I have no idea what they're saying they're not speaking Farsi they're like making sounds it's really bad so I'm just gonna stick to reading I don't think I'm gonna listen to any more of it those 20 minutes were like enough for me <laughs> so Magnus explains that entire situation They've also decided that Jesse is going to come back to London with them, but they can't say that he's Jesse because they're not sure how to explain that to the Clave without the Clave wanting to probably kill him or imprison him because Belial was essentially possessing his body and going around and killing shadow hunters and stealing their runes. So they've decided that they're going to pretend that he is the descendant of a different Blackthorn, like a long lost grandson of this other Blackthorn. I can't remember his name, but they're gonna say that his name is Jeremy Blackthorn. He did not know he was a shadow hunter and he just showed up here. So they're gonna lie to the clave, which is always fun. <laughs> Ariadne came out to her mom in a fit of rage because she she was upset that her dad is potentially blackmailing somebody with that letter. They finally learned the contents of the letter that she had found and it wasn't addressed to anyone so they don't know who it was meant to be sent to but it basically was just talking about how they want to take down the Herondales and the Lightwoods. So now they know that her dad, the Inquisitor, is trying to blackmail somebody but they don't know who or why. And so she came out to her mom while she was upset in that moment and her mom was not accepting so she left. She ran to Anna's and was like, can I stay here? And so now she's staying with Anna. She also just talked to 
to Matthew too and explain to him that she came out to her mom and they had a great conversation about it. Hopefully it brings them closer and they can resolve some of their issues because I want Anna and Ariadne to be happy. <laughs> Christopher's fire messages, rune fire messages have been working. So uh, that's good news potentially. I don't know what they're gonna use it for, but he also went to go visit Grace while she was in the Silent City and Grace realizes that he doesn't know what she's done because James hasn't told anyone, even though she expected him to have told everyone by now. But James hasn't told anyone, and as we know, he hasn't told Cordelia either about the whole Gracelet situation because, as he says, he doesn't want to be pitied. He's in, like, so much turmoil. He's in so much pain over this because he just thinks that people are going to pity him and he doesn't want to be pitied. And there's this really good passage where he talks about how anytime he thinks about it, he feels so disgusted and he feels violated. I don't want him to feel like that, obviously, but, like, that's what I've been saying for these last two books. Like, it's been so bad for him and I knew he was gonna be in so much pain when he finally got out of the trance that he was under, the spell that he was under. Now he just feels all this guilt and all this shame and he feels like everything is his fault and I just want to take him and give him a hug and tell him that nothing is his fault. Actually, I want Cordelia to do that. I want her to hold him and tell him that none of it is his fault and he didn't do anything wrong and that she loves him too. That just has to happen. It has to. <laughs> Every moment that James and Cordelia have together right now is just like utterly heartbreaking. There was a scene where he calls her Daisy and then she says don't call me that and oh my god that broke my heart. <laughs> oh and that's the update with Cordelia. So she has not come back home with James. She didn't want to go back with him and stay at their house so she decided to go back with her mother and stay with her mom until her mom uh, has the baby because I forgot that her mom was pregnant which again I remember now that baby is not on the um, family tree which again I hate to go back to the untrustworthy family tree but I have to because the baby's not on the family tree like she doesn't have another child so the child can't die because then it would still be on the family tree so it's never going to be born so her mom has to die probably that's my guess there's just no way this baby is gonna be born because it's not on that tree but again I don't know I'm naive I guess to trust the tree <laughs> but anyway point being she's staying with her mom for now and her mom asks her if she wants to go to Tehran with her because her mom wants to go back to Tehran and live in the Institute there and Alistair has agreed to go with her too and she asks Cordelia if she wants to go too. No! <laughs> you can't go back! Not when James is here! I will be so upset if we have to spend like another long portion of this book with them separated, like physically separated. I'm fine with her going if James goes too. As long as they're together, I don't care where they are. But she cannot go alone! But then the other main thing that's been kind of going on plot-wise is the whole paladin situation with Lilith. Belial is terrified of Cortana because Cortana can kill him, but they're not exactly sure what kill means means because he's already basically been nearly killed by Cortana twice so they're like maybe third time's the charm it'll actually kill him or somehow take him down and stop him this time so he's terrified of Cortana and Cordelia because of Cortana but he doesn't know that Cordelia can't use Cortana right now because of her oath with Lilith so they're trying to keep that a secret from Belial and hope that he doesn't find that out so they can maybe use it against him so yeah that's pretty much what's been going on to catch you up on what I read. So we're gonna have to see where this goes. I'm really curious what's going to happen. Obviously another big battle sort of thing has to happen because there's always a big battle in the finales of her series. There's usually a big battle in like every book. But yeah, anyway, I'm very curious to see where the plot is going to go because I really have no idea. Obviously they're gonna have to fight Belial. Obviously they're gonna have to find a way to separate Lilith from Cordelia and free her of her oath. Before it started, I was just like, I don't want it to end. I don't want to know what's going to happen. And now I'm just like, I need to know what happens. I need to know. <laughs> I feel like that one Michael Scott meme where he's like, there's no doubt about it. I'm ready to get hurt again. That's how I feel reading this book. <laughs> Lucy and Cordelia just had a fight. Oh, that one really hurt. <laughs> They have not really spoken at all in this book and they barely spoke in the last one and they've just been hiding things from each other this entire time. Lucy about working with Grace to help Jessie and the fact that she was in love with Jessie. Cordelia about what her real feelings for James are and running away with Matthew and the paladin situation and all of that. And they finally had that moment where everything just boils over and Cordelia was just so upset. She regretted what she said to Lucy like immediately Immediately, but then Lucy was already gone and oh my god I just I want them to be paramatai I want them to be okay I know they're gonna work it out like they're gonna work it out it's gonna be fine because they really just needed to have a moment like that with each other they needed to air all their grievances they needed to get it all out in the open oh my god 
Yes. Okay, so Jesse is finally talking to Grace. She actually told him the truth about everything finally and he is actually calling her out on it he's telling her that she has to tell everyone what she's done because what she's done is horrible and she's manipulated all of these people james especially and she's asking jesse not to tell anybody because the silent brothers don't want her to tell anybody but he's like no you just want to use me i'm not gonna lie for you and then she says ask james he will tell you just as i have talk to him before you speak with anyone else he has a right and then jesse stops her and he's like you're the last person to lecture me about james's rights yes <laughs> yes! That's what I've been saying! Thank you, Jesse. Oh my god. I must go. I feel sick. Me too, bitch. Oh my god. Literally me last night being like, I have so much more sympathy for Grace, but then the second someone calls Grace out on what she's done... <sighs> Oh, it feels so good. Despite the fact that I can have some sympathy for her, I don't forgive what she has done because it's so bad. And our poor James is suffering so much because of it. Cordelia is suffering so much because of it. Matthew is suffering. Everyone is suffering because of what Grace has done. And yes, she was manipulated. Yes, we can acknowledge that and understand that. However, despite the fact that she was manipulated, she did have some free will. It wasn't like she was completely being controlled. And she could have confessed the truth earlier, but she chose not to do that. So this was so satisfying this is what I needed. This is what I've needed since the first book. <laughs> uh. <laughs> James is talking about how Will has always raised him to depend on his friends and his parabatai, and he says it was something James loved about his father, but it also meant he could not approach him to talk about Matthew and Cordelia. He could not admit to his father that he was angry with Matthew. James was sure Will had never been angry with Jem in his life. Shut James, please just talk to your father because I promise you he can tell you stories. We've got three books worth of your parents going through basically exactly what you're going through right now in your identical situation. Please just talk to Will. Like, he will help you. I promise. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> Cordelia went to go see Matthew and talk to him about his drinking and he's just been an absolute mess and he has not been doing well and he's not okay and so he goes home and so she sends a message to James, Thomas and Christopher and all of them go to check on him. Then they're just trying to help him, they're trying to get it out of his system and help him go through withdrawals essentially and they say he needs to rest and he's like I don't want you to leave and so they all stay with him. <laughs> And then we have this beautiful picture. <laughs> I'm so emotional. <laughs> I love the Mary Thieves so much. And Oscar too. He's also with them. <laughs> in the same place that her father was killed because she wants to question the demon about Belial because demons aren't afraid of her since she's Lilith's paladin, they kind of listen to her. So she makes the decision to go do that and doesn't tell anyone, keeps it a secret because she knows that it's like risky and people are going to tell her not to do it. She goes, James finds out that she's there by accident and he ends up following her because he thinks that she's going back to the place where her father died because she wants to die too because he's worried that he made her so miserable because of everything that's happened with grace and their marriage and everything and he's worried that she's gonna try and kill herself and so he freaks out he goes there he kills the demon and then takes her back to their house and is like what were you thinking how could you do that i was so worried about you and she's like no i didn't want to die that's not what was happening and then he says you cannot hurt yourself daisy you must not hate me hit me do anything you want to me cut up my suits and set fire to my books tear my heart into pieces scatter them across england but do not harm your Herself. He pulled her toward him, suddenly pressing his lips to her hair, her cheek. She caught him by the arms, her fingers digging into his sleeves, holding him to her. I swear to the angel, he said in a muffled voice, if you die, I will die and I will haunt you. I will give you no peace. And then he kisses her. Ah! Oh, I 
am so sorry for all of the inhumane sounds that I have made throughout this video, but there will be many more to come because we're not even halfway through yet. We're not even halfway through yet, babes, and I'm losing it. <laughs> Anyway, then they make out and then Effie walks in on them and then he's like, can you please stay? Like, I have to tell you something because I think he's finally gonna tell her. It's been so hard for him to talk about it because it makes him relive everything because he went through something extremely traumatic. Having your consent taken away like that is horrifying. And then she's just like, it's too much right now. She's so overwhelmed by what happened and she wants to stay, but she knows that she needs to clear her head. So she goes and then says, we'll talk at the Christmas party. Will and Tessa's Christmas party that's supposed to be happening soon. And I just... Just let them have their happy moment. I, I need it. I need it to happen. I need her to know the truth. I need us to finally have some kind of resolution. I'm a bitch who loves angst, okay? I will always ask for angst. But then every time I get angst, I complain about it. And that's just the way it is. I'm suffering, but it's good suffering, you know? You know? So... I'm having a horrible great time. <laughs> I'm really hoping this conversation finally happens soon because it's been too long and we're like nearly halfway through the book at this point and if I don't get at least like a decent chunk of this with them being happy by the end or at least just knowing the truth and knowing that they love each other fully, completely, honestly, I will be very upset. Tatiana Blackthorne just like transformed into some weird monster creature. I don't really know what just happened. And also James ended up using the mirror that Tatiana Blackthorne had. Jesse remembered that Tatiana had this mirror where she would kind of watch over Belial or she used it to communicate with him but she would sometimes watch him through it. So they find this mirror and then James uses it to spy on Belial and they see him sitting on a throne with a bunch of chimera demons. And so they think that, that he's going to use these chimera demons to possess someone or something to create some army. So yeah, don't know what's going on there. To be honest with you, I'm very confused about the plot. <laughs> I just have no clue where it's going. So I don't even really have predictions. I just I just know a battle is going to happen at some point. But now I just got to a scene where Grace and Christopher are talking again and she wants to confess to Christopher what she's done. But Christopher's saying like, it doesn't seem like I'm the person you should be confessing to because it doesn't seem like I'm the person you've wronged. And she hasn't like explained everything at all. She's saying that the person who needs to know is Cordelia. So I think she is going to tell Cordelia Cordelia, which would have been my second choice. Like I do think James should tell her, but also Cordelia really is the second biggest victim of Grace's wrongdoings because she was heavily involved in that entire situation and she deserves to hear the truth. And I think Grace telling her is a good plan. So hopefully Grace tells her and then she just like runs to James immediately after that. That's what I need to happen. That's, that's really what I need. <laughs> oh my God. We're gonna find out what's written with in the locket, in the in the necklace that he gave her. I forgot, I literally forgot about this. In the, the world like pendant necklace that he gave her, that James gave Cordelia, there was something written in it. And I think they mentioned that in Chain of Iron, but I did not remember this. Oh my God. Okay, 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 I have to, I have to pause. I have to pause before I keep going. <laughs> It's a poem by Lord Byron that was in the necklace. There are two things in my destiny, a world to roam through and a home with thee. The first were nothing had I the last, it were the haven of my happiness. And he says, it means I would rather have a home with you than all the world. I just need them to accept that they're in love. And then as we keep going in that scene, he's trying to explain that like, if you don't believe me now saying that I love you now because you think that I just changed my mind because I thought I lost you, believe the James who put that note in that necklace. And she's like, okay, so you've loved me the whole time and you also loved Grace the whole time. And then he's like, no, I never loved Grace. And Cordelia just can't accept this because she thinks he's lying because she just doesn't know. And, Oh my god, now she's leaving, and I'm so upset, I have to keep going. <gasps> what? Esme Hardcastle. Just as Cordelia leaves that room right after that conversation, James tries to follow her out and then runs into Esme Hardcastle. If we've mentioned her before, if we've seen her before, I do not remember who she is. And she has a pen and notepad in hand and she asks him, I'm sorry to interrupt you, James, but as you know, I'm working on a family tree like the family tree. And it would be awfully helpful to know, are you and Cordelia planning to have children? And if so, how many? Two or six or seven? Esme James said, the family tree is going to be very inaccurate if this is the way you're going about things. Not at all, she said, you'll see. What does that mean? 
mean? Okay, hold on. Let me go grab my family tree. The very inaccurate family tree. I just, I... You know, I know this whole thing is just like lies, but I'm so confused. Used. I'm very lost. I'm very lost. I need to not I need to not look at this I think we need to finish the book and then I need to go back to this and then we can figure out what's going on here I'm breaking. I'm I can't I can't, <laughs> I can't take this. Okay So Cordelia ran out of that room not because she was just too flustered with what happened with James and him Explaining the locket situation but because she had to go find Matthew because she had to tell Matthew that she can't love him the way that he wants her to love him because she still loves James and she doesn't know what she's going to do about it but she can't give Matthew what he's looking for and Matthew is not taking it very well which is understandable because he's going through a lot right now but like it's really hurting <laughs> she says I know I must not let there be false hope between us and he says am I so hard to love no <laughs> Cordelia says, you are so easy to love, so easy that it has caused all this trouble, but you don't love me. I understand you've made it clear enough. I'm a drunk and always will be. <laughs> Matthew! <laughs> oh, it hurts. I said I don't want them to be together because I knew it was just going to end in all of this pain. I'm so upset. I'm so upset. <laughs> it's fine. It'll all be fine. Everyone is going to be just fine. I love lying to myself. <laughs> Tatiana Blackthorn just showed up. She's still herself and not in some weird demon form, but she just exposed to everyone at the Haredale Christmas party that Tessa is Belial's daughter. And so now everyone just knows, okay, this is not gonna end well. <laughs> she currently is holding Alexander Lightwood, Cecily Lightwood's baby, like infant child at knife point. And I just had flashbacks to City of Glass. Now I'm stressed, <laughs> more stressed than I was. I feel like we're getting so close to everyone finding out the full truth about Grace and Tatiana and what they did to James and I feel like that really has to come out for so much more of the story to properly unfold and I'm about almost halfway through the book at this point and there's still so much yet to come and so much that needs to be resolved and so many questions that need answers and I'm concerned that we're not gonna get all the answers and we're just gonna be left with more questions. Okay but now that the secret is out about Belial and the Herondales being related to Belial this is gonna be such a problem because the clave is so annoying. Even though we already dealt with all of this in the Infernal Devices and Tessa being half demon, being a warlock, like it's already been resolved. I don't know why we need to rehash this now. Like Tatiana is just bringing up old issues that nobody has an issue with anymore, except some of the more conservative members of the clave who also just really hate the Herondales for whatever reason. So you know it's gonna cause a lot of problems and it's not gonna be good. <laughs> I love Ari standing up to her father. Inquisitor Bridgestock is horrible and I love that she's standing up to him because her family has been so awful to her and she deserves good things and deserves to stand up for herself. I think Grace is finally gonna tell Cordelia. This is what I've been waiting for and I'm also so unprepared. <laughs> oh my god, okay. Chapter 23. It starts with Cordelia Ran. When was the last time we read a chapter that started with the words Cordelia Ran? in Chain of Iron. After she sees James and Grace together and assumes that he's still in love with her and then runs away to Paris. The parallels, this has to be the moment. This has to be the moment where she is going to tell him because she sent a note to him saying, meet me at the house. I need to speak with you immediately. I love a good parallel. Oh my God. It's finally time. The moment I've been praying for is finally here. <laughs> my mother moved us to London so that I might be closer to him, exert more power over him, but ultimately it failed. All hell's power could not extinguish that love. Heron Daisy is supreme, okay? I... <laughs> this is all I wanted. This is all I have wanted. Oh my god, it only took 450 pages to get here. But we're finally here. Literally, I did not expect more artwork. Hello? Oh my god. I'm losing my mind. I... It literally blew the door open. The door is locked. And so he literally just shot his gun at it to open it. <laughs> Not a shower scene. What? 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 Hello? They are not in a... 
I, oh my god, I, I, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay, let's just... Let's take a breather. That was what I've been waiting for. That was the moment I've been waiting for. For Cordelia to find out the truth, run to him, they both confess their love to each other, and they finally are together. And then I was not expecting a, like a bathtub scene <laughs> after that, but here we are. This is too much good, happy stuff happening in the middle of the book because there's this much left, which means there's this much time for a lot of pain, and I'm not I I don't even want to think about that. There comes a time in every single one of these books where I'm like, it's time to just close the book. I wish I could stop right here and not keep reading because I know it's gonna get bad from here on out. But I'm gonna, I'm just gonna savor this for now. The moment in this that just really, really got me is when Cordelia says, I love you. Where is this moment? I need to find it. Yeah, it's when she says, I love you. And she's never said it to him before. She says, I love you. And then she says it in Farsi. She says, Eshketem, I love you. I love you without you. I cannot breathe. The use of Farsi in these books really kills me. Like every single time they say anything to each other in Farsi, like at the beginning when James was having that dream and he said something like Khayli Khoshkeli or something like that, which is means you're very beautiful. I, I just die. I just die. Every time they speak Farsi to each other, it really gets me. So for her to be like, Eshkitam, like I... <sighs> it's so good. <laughs> Oh my god, okay, I'm sorry, but James saying I adore discussing domestic details with you, talk to me of locksmiths and grocery deliveries and what's wrong with the second stove, it's giving in another life I would have really liked doing taxes and laundry with you or whatever the line is from everything everywhere all at once. Oh my god, they're just so good and so perfect for each other and now I'm so worried that everything is gonna be torn away from us because I trust nothing. Okay, I love how in this with Tatiana, she has just fully become Mrs. Havisham from Great Expectations. If you haven't read Great Expectations or you don't know the story of Great Expectations, a lot of the story is influenced by Great Expectations. Uh, you can especially tell in the first book. But uh, Tatiana Blackthorne is absolutely Mrs. Havisham, who is this woman who has basically just been sitting in her rotting old home wearing the wedding dress from her wedding night where she was jilted. And she's just been wearing the wedding dress, letting the wedding dress rot with her. And Tatiana Blackthorne is literally also just kind of devolving it's describing what she looks like and it says her hair has lost every last bit of its color It was bone white straggling about her face like a corpse's hair Her dress was filthy matted with blood at the shoulder. She's literally just becoming mrs. Havisham Like she's just still wearing the same old bloody crusty dress and she's just becoming like older and older in like a short span of time And that's very much Mrs. Havisham. Despite the fact that I don't like Great Expectations as a book, I love the parallels to Great Expectations. It's actually, I'm glad I've read the story and I know the story because I can see the parallels. So that's been a nice part of the experience of reading this. Christopher is dead? What do you mean Christopher is dead? He is not dead. Okay, quick recap of everything that just happened. They basically found out what Belial's whole plan was. Tatiana Blackthorne wanted to be captured and imprisoned in the Silent City because she wanted to have access to the tombs there because what Belial was trying to do was possess the bodies of the Silent Brothers and Iron Sisters who were in the tombs in the Silent City and use their bodies as vessels for the demons that he wanted to possess them to create his army. So that's why she needed access to the Silent City. So when she went there and she saw Grace there, she also had one of these Silent Brothers who are not Silent Brothers take Grace's powers away. So Grace is stripped of her powers now. And then Grace ends up escaping and running to the fairy child's house and everyone is already there because James called everyone there so he could tell everyone what happened with Grace and the bracelet and everything so he's finally told everybody but then Grace shows up and she tells him everything that's happened and then Tatiana shows up outside with her little mini army of these silent brothers and then she makes demands and says that she wants Cortana, James to give himself up to Belial and then Jesse to come to her side and all of them say no and so then a fight breaks out. Kit ends up getting hit by something in the shoulder and now he's dead, but he cannot be dead. There's like no way he's dead. There's still too much going on and too much left. And also he's still on that family tree and he marries Grace. So there's no way Christopher is dead. Yes, call me delusional, but I still have faith in the family tree. <laughs> but amidst the battle, Lucy ends up raising the ghost of Rupert Blackthorne, Tatiana's 
husband, who's the person she's basically been trying to get revenge for this entire time, and we've never really understood why. But apparently he was killed and she blamed the Herondales and the Carstairs for it for some reason. But Rupert says that it wasn't them. Tatiana's father is the one who killed Rupert. And then he like denounces her and he's like, you're not the woman that I loved. And she starts to lose her mind and then she runs off and then Grace goes after her and Cordelia goes after the two of them and she tells Grace to get away and she ends up picking up a sword and summons Lilith. Now I have no idea what's going to happen but I just stopped at them saying that Christopher is dead because no he's not. There's no way he's dead. First of all we have Lucy who can pretty much almost raise the dead. Not really. I know what she does is technically not necromancy, but like it's kind of close and I feel like if he was, was just wounded, we can do something about it. And I just don't think that he's gonna be dead. There's just no way that he is. There's no way. Absolutely no way. What? <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Cordelia just killed Tatiana. <laughs> I mean, because of the oath with Lilith, but she still did it. And then Lilith tells her that if she had used Cordana, she could have saved Tatiana's life. Because as the legends say, a paladin's blade has the power of salvation as well as destruction. You can heal someone that you've harmed. And I think Christopher might actually be dead. I really hope not, because that wouldn't make any sense. But also, no, he can't be dead. No, 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 no. Don't offer yourself up, James. Don't offer yourself up. I can't do this. No! <laughs> no! No, oh my god. No. Intermission? You know what? I really need an intermission. <laughs> There's just so much going on. <laughs> Belial shows up, he starts possessing the bodies of different mundanes and killing them each one by one and he just will not stop until James agrees to go to Edom with him and he also promises to allow all of the shadow hunters in London to uh, escape within like 36 hours or something only if James comes with him so James agrees Cordelia's like absolutely not don't you dare do it and then before she can do anything about it they're ripped apart and then Matthew goes after James he ends up grabbing onto him and then both of them get sucked into Edom by Belial and everyone else is just left in London. Everyone is acting like Matthew and James are dead. They're not dead. I know they're not dead. And now Cordelia is just miserable and alone. All I understand that Belial really wants is just to control and like rule London, but why? Like just because he's a demon and he's bored and he feels like it? I. I don't really understand. Like, I just don't get what his motivations are. I'm a little iffy on that. I also don't understand what Lilith's motivations are entirely, other than she wants her realm back from Belial, that part I get. But I don't get what else she wants, because I feel like she definitely wants something else too. It can't just be that. But I will get some rest, let some of this sink in, because I don't think I've fully processed the last 500 plus pages. And then we will reconvene tomorrow and finish up the book. Good morning, everyone. I dressed for the occasion. It is day three of reading this book. We are nearing the end. I read actually a little bit more yesterday after I said that I was gonna go to sleep. I read like one more chapter. I'm on page 582. I am in chapter 28, I believe. Yes. So not much left to go, a little bit less than 200 pages left, and we will be finished with Chain of Thorns. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> but anyway, basically the last thing that had happened was James and Matthew getting pulled through with Belial. All of the shadow hunters in London had to evacuate the city within 36 hours, and so everyone got out, but our main characters all stayed behind because they're trying to save James and Matthew. So Cordelia, Thomas, Alistair, Anna, Ari, they're all staying behind. I might have missed somebody. I'm having a hard time keeping track of everyone right now. I'm very overwhelmed. I was about to say Christopher and then I remembered he's dead. Oh, also Lucy and Jesse. How could I forget? But anyway, we're gonna get through the remainder of this and see how it goes. I'm deeply, deeply concerned. Let's do it. 
against my better judgment, I'm gonna finish the book. <laughs> I will say though, so far, I feel like it hasn't been as sad as I was anticipating. I know Christopher dying was very sad, but I feel like I haven't had the heartbreak that I was expecting. Maybe I'm just expecting Clockwork Princess levels of heartbreak, which is really hard to match. Like nothing's really matched that in terms of fantasy series I've read, but I feel like that's what I've been anticipating or just any Cassie Clare finale level despair. Every single one of her finales are just so heart-wrenching and I feel like I haven't fully felt that yet. The grief intermission was a lot, but I feel like it wasn't as much as I thought it would be. Maybe it's because I'm less attached to Christopher than some of the other characters, even though that was still very upsetting. I feel like it's not that sad, but like, who knows? Maybe my Matthew theory is true. I don't, I don't want to believe it's true. Now that we've had one major character death, I don't want to believe that Matthew's also going to die. Like, it can't happen, right? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, there's only one way to find out. I have to keep going. <laughs> Listen, I love these books because everyone is gay. <laughs> this entire friend group is queer. And then they have their like two token straight couples. And that's just so realistic. <laughs> there was that whole scene earlier where Matthew confronts his brother about being blackmailed by the Inquisitor because the Inquisitor is basically blackmailing him since he found out he was gay and he doesn't want to come out. So he's going along with what the Inquisitor is saying. But then Matthew's like, you have to stop because he's going to ruin everybody's lives. And then he's like, you don't understand but he's talking to Matthew, Thomas, and Alistair, all of whom are also queer. So they all literally do understand what it feels like to be outed or to come out. And then with Ari and Anna and Thomas and Alistair, like the conversations that they all have with each other, it's just so refreshing because I don't think we've ever had another Cassie Clare series where there were this many queer characters. Like the majority of her book series have queer characters in them and queer relationships, but this one by far has the most. And it's just so nice. Okay, I have about 100 pages left. I'm actually almost exactly 100 pages left. I am at the start of chapter 33. James just agreed to allow Belial to possess him. So that's fun. Cordelia and Lucy are in Edom trying to save Matthew and James. So she made another deal with Lilith that if Lilith gets them into Edom so that they can kill Belial, if she kills Belial, Lilith will free her from her oath. So she's here to save James and Matthew and kill Belial. And she has Cortana again. And when Lilith said earlier that with an oath, if she uses Cortana, she can hurt and heal with her sword. So if she kills James possessed by Belial, which is what I said I thought was going to happen in uh, Chain of Iron. So like, I think I was still right. He's gonna be possessed by Belial and Cordelia's gonna have to kill him and then we're all gonna be like sad for a second because we're gonna be like, oh my God, she killed him. But then she's just gonna heal him with the same blade. So I think that's what's gonna happen. I think she's gonna have to kill him, but then she's gonna be able to heal him. So everything will be fine. Okay, I am on chapter 35. It's the last chapter before a coda. She literally included an intermission and a coda and then the epilogue. So. That's, that's it. I'm on page 722 and there's 778 pages or something. I have like 50 pages left and James is still possessed by Belial and there's so much left unresolved. How are we going to resolve it in this amount of time? This is also, I think the 10th time I have read the sentence Cordelia ran in this book. There are so many chapters that start with the words Cordelia ran and then so many other lines that it just says Cordelia ran. She literally has spent this whole book running. Like a girl is in her Forrest Gump era, but right now she's running to Westminster Abbey to confront Belial slash James because Belial's plan is to literally have a coronation for himself, like in the traditional style of the monarchs of England. Like he's, he's literally just trying to crown himself the king of England. I literally don't understand why. His motivations make no sense. Anyway, I am so stressed out. We don't have enough time to figure everything out, but we also have too much time left for things to go awry. So let's keep going. <laughs> I knew it was coming, I knew it was coming, and yet Cordelia's confronting Belial. James regains control of his body. And he's like, Cordelia, give me Cortana. And she does. And he says, Daisy. And he plunged the sword into his own heart. Why? It's fine. It's fine. There's still enough time left. We can fix 
fix this. Cordelia's gonna heal him with Cortana. It, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be it's gonna be okay. I refuse to believe anything else. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive, everyone. It is fine. Everything is okay. We are we're good. We're good. Literally, oh, it's exactly what I said. It's exactly what I said. I am a prophet. I love that she is getting out of this oath with Lilith because of semantics. That's the shit I would do. <laughs> James threatening Lilith with this gun. I did not realize this gun was gonna play like such an important role in this whole story. Honestly, not my personal choice of weapon, but it's kind of funny. I think everything is gonna be fine. I only have a coda and an epilogue left. I don't trust Cassie Clare epilogues, but like, I mean, what could possibly happen that's that bad in just these two chapters now that everything's over. Belial's dead, Lilith is gone, Tatiana's dead, like every villain is gone. So like nothing bad can possibly happen now. Okay, Cordelia does have another brother. Zachary Carstairs? My whole theory about her mom dying and this child never being born was just completely wrong because I'm sorry I had too much faith in that family tree. I didn't think it would betray me like this. Oh, stop! Any mention of Jem, Will, and Tessa literally makes me tear up. This section is from Jem's perspective and he's just kind of observing the aftermath of everything that happened and seeing who's standing around. And he says that Matthew is standing there with his parents and Will and Tessa, their hands stretched out for Jem, as they always were. <laughs> Don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. It is impossible for me to not cry at a mention of them. But Belial's still around? He's talking to Jem. I'm so confused. So he's like a reincarnation of Belial, like the next gen Belial. What did any of that mean? Okay, so Belial came back in some like new form, like a new version of Belial. He's basically saying that he has no interest in the Herondales. He's not interested in killing them. He just wants to regain his strength. And Jem is like, so you're saying that if the Herondales leave you alone, you'll leave them alone. And he's like, yes absolutely and then he's like okay i'll tell the herondales that and so now i'm wondering if in the wicked powers i'll put a picture of queen of air and darkness up on the screen in case you haven't read that book just if you don't want to be spoiled just leave for a minute until it's gone i'm wondering if kit since he's a herondale is going to somehow i don't know get involved with this iteration of belial and then try and kill him and then it's gonna result in like another new conflict or something. It's gotta come up in the Wicked Powers. Like it's definitely gotta come up in the Wicked Powers. Anyway, epilogue time. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't I don't even know what to expect. Am I gonna be happy? Am I gonna sob my eyes out? I I don't know. was penance. <laughs> that was penance for what she put us through in Clockwork Princess because it was the happiest epilogue I have ever read. And the last sentence of the book is literally side by side with James. Cordelia ran. I have been spending these past like three years <laughs> with these books coming out just waiting for pain. Like just utter, utter pain. And for it to be this happy, I am shocked. I am in disbelief. I just can't believe everyone is this okay. Yes, Christopher's death was definitely sad and it was painful for all of them, but to be honest, I really think she killed off the like character that people probably cared about the least. I mean, she could have killed off Grace and people would not have cared. But of all of them, I feel like Christopher was probably the safest choice to kill because it would upset the least amount of people. I don't even know how to explain what I'm feeling at the moment. How was it this happy? What do you mean they're all happy and okay? I literally spent this entire video being like, I just want them to be happy. I just want them to be happy. And then she made them all happy and now I'm confused. You know what they say, be careful what you wish for. Like I got exactly what I wished for and maybe it's my trust issue speaking, but I just can't even believe that it's real <laughs> Okay, you, I, I need to take a few I will come back and just do final wrap-up thoughts on everything Just give me like an hour or so I need everything to fully sink in. All right. I have recovered. I think everything has started to finally sink in I had some lunch. So now I have some more energy 
it's time to talk about my final thoughts on Chain of Thorns. I think I'm still just in a little bit of shock that the series is over. I want to talk about this first because I feel like it's kind of gnawing away at me and also the overwhelming feeling that I have about a lot of the events kind of ties back to this. I think this is easily my least favorite in this series. The first two books in my opinion were better and I have to admit overall I am a little bit disappointed. <laughs> it's not to say I didn't enjoy it or I didn't have a good time. It's just compared to the first two, I think those are much stronger books. Overall, for a conclusion, this felt a little too neat. Hello, hi, pardon the interruption. This is me um, about a week and a half after having finished Chain of Thorns. What you were just watching was me like about an hour after finishing the book and I had not let everything fully settle in yet and now I have. And I have more thoughts. <laughs> so like I said, I unfortunately felt, even immediately after finishing the book, a little bit disappointed and I could just tell that something felt different to me, that it just wasn't the same as the other books and I wasn't able to understand or fully articulate why when I'd initially finished the book because I think it was too fresh in my mind. But having sat with it for a while now, I ended up changing my rating for the book. <laughs> I'd originally given it four stars and I ended up dropping it down to three and I'm gonna explain why. <laughs> First and foremost, I had this weird sense about the writing from the very beginning. I didn't talk about it throughout the video because I kept gaslighting myself into thinking that it was just me and that I was just not used to reading Cassandra Clare books anymore for some reason because it had been two years since I'd read my last one, even though I've been reading basically one every single year since the time I was 12 years old. So I know her writing very well, but for some reason I just, I felt like the writing in this book was different. It felt different to me. The beginning especially felt really rushed. It felt really cheesy even though her books are always a little bit of cheesy, which I appreciate, and I actually like that trait in her writing, but something about the writing of this one was extra cheesy, and not necessarily in the good way. I specifically remember scenes with Alistair and Thomas. I think it was when Thomas was writing one of those like fire messages at the very beginning of the book to Alistair, thinking that he wasn't gonna get it, and he was saying something like, why do you always have to be such an annoying idiot or a dumb idiot or something, and it was just like the wording of it felt so weird. And it was just things like that throughout the book, but especially like I said at the beginning, that just felt so odd to me and it felt out of character for her in terms of like Cassandra Clare's writing. It was just not like her usual writing to me. And the whole time I was just like, is it me? Is it because I've gotten older and I'm just not used to this anymore or I like a different style of writing now? I feel like I need to go back and reread the first two books to see if it is just me or if it really is different from the other books, but please let me know what you think because I felt so odd about the writing and I don't really know how to explain what it is specifically. I can't pinpoint it, but something felt odd. It was also incredibly rushed at times and it was repetitive. This was especially apparent at the very beginning, I think mostly because we were getting a lot of kind of info dumping and it was just giving us more information about what had happened in the previous books just to refresh your memory, but I felt like it was a little bit too much and just throughout the book, I felt like it just got really, really repetitive, which is why I think the book was definitely too long. It needed to be cut down a bit there were times where the plot was just dragged out and I was just waiting for it to get to the point. And then other times I felt like we were just missing things. We just didn't delve enough into a specific relationship. And I think that's in part because there are kind of too many characters in this story if you really think about it. Like I love all of them, don't get me wrong. I really, really do. But I feel like because it's such a full, full cast, there was not enough time to actually give enough attention to each of the couples and each of the characters. So I felt like something was just always a bit lacking and I wanted a little bit more out of each interaction that we got with all of the side characters. I was pretty satisfied with what we got with James and Cordelia. I do have a couple gripes there, but in terms of like their actual relationship, that was great. But we didn't get much focus on anyone else. And especially I think with like Matthew's character and his arc, I feel like we just kind of let that go. Like there was so much more to do there. We're kind of just like immediately like, okay, he's gonna be working on his addiction and he's gonna start working through that and now suddenly he's just gonna go travel the world. I wanted like more with him and James specifically. I feel like we really could have delved into their relationship a little bit more and I feel like it was a missed opportunity with Matthew which is why I was thinking he was gonna die because we really weren't getting into his character as much as I thought that we would be if he was meant to survive and then he did survive which I'm happy about but then I just felt a little unsatisfied because we didn't get enough 
about him, if that makes sense. Oh, and backtracking really quick to the repetitive writing, I mentioned this earlier while I was reading the book. The number of times we read the phrase Cordelia ran in this book, I think is a good example of how repetitive the book got. I understand that it was used as like a motif, but it was kind of excessive sometimes. And that's just like one example of how repetitive it felt, not just with uh, the writing in terms of the sentences used, but in terms of the like plot points. Like we were constantly just rehashing the same problems over and over again and it was getting very tedious at a certain point. I know I love angst, I know I talked about that several times throughout the video too, but it just genuinely felt like we needed to get to some sort of resolution and then when we finally did get to the resolution we just went through it all so quickly that it felt a little odd. Like I was just confused by the time we got to the end because suddenly everyone was happy after we spent over a thousand pages at this point, if we include the first two books, of this constant buildup and then you get to the most climactic point, it just kind of dissolves and it's like oh everything's happy now. It was just super quick, super quick and I wanted more out of that. <laughs> the other thing, I also touched on this while I was reading the book, the villain's motivations made no sense. What the fuck did Belial want? Literally all Belial wanted was to be crowned king of London. Why? Can anyone answer that question? You cannot, there is no reason. He just wanted a crown. Like for the vibes, for the aesthetic, it made no sense. <laughs> Lilith also, no explanation for why she wanted anything other than her realm back, which again makes sense, but there was nothing else there. I know that this series is not about the plot and it's about the characters and as a characters over plot girly, I never care that much if the plot's like a little lackluster, but in this case the plot was just completely disregarded and you could feel it the entire time. I could feel that as she was writing the book she was like, okay I know where I want these characters to end up, but I have no idea what, what I want to do with the plot, so we're just gonna make some stuff up as we go along. I don't know how to explain this other than when I usually read Cassandra Clare books I get lost in the story. Like I am just in the story for the story, I am with these characters, I am living it as they are living it. But when I was reading this book, I felt like I was reading a book. I felt like I was in her head as she was plotting out the story, plotting out the characters and everything because I could feel it being written. It's like when you're watching a movie that's really, really well acted. It's so well acted, you feel like it's actually real versus when you watch a movie that's not all that great and you can tell that the actors are acting. That's how I felt. I could feel the writing and I, I didn't like that. I didn't want that. I wanted to feel the story, feel the characters, but I didn't feel that way with this one and I'm so sad. <laughs> Something else I also talked about earlier I feel like choosing Christopher to be the major character death in this story was the easy choice. <laughs> I'm not like all that mad about it. It's just that like I said earlier, I wanted more pain. <laughs> I wanted more suffering, more emotion, and call me a masochist, but honestly, I would have preferred if, again, I don't want Matthew to die, I don't want James or Cordelia to die, but I would have preferred if it had been something more emotional. A character didn't even have to die, it just, it needed more of that emotional impact, and I just felt like we didn't get it, and I feel like the choice of Christopher for the, like, major character death, it felt like she just wanted to have a character die for the sake of keeping up with her trend in finales and in all of her series, because it's always a major character who dies. And honestly, I think it would have been fine if nobody had died or if we had just done something a little different because that was my other thing with this series. It really, really felt, especially with this book, it felt like she kind of ran out of ideas and then just recycled all of the major storylines, major plot lines and stuff that she's used and arcs that she's used in her other series in this series, but just kind of dulled them down a little bit so they weren't as impactful. And maybe this is just because I am so familiar with these books. I've read them since I was super young and I've read so many of them that I just really, really know these stories so well and all of the plot points and everything that it just feels like the same thing happening over and over again. And if you've never read any of her other books and you read this, it would feel really new to you. But as somebody who's read all of the other ones, it really just felt like recycled plot lines. But I didn't feel that way with the first two but with the conclusion it really felt that way because you can start something off the same way and then end up changing it by the end and it'll feel completely new and 
different, but she ended up kind of going in the same direction that she has for the most part with most of her series. And I mean, when you've written this many books in one series, in one universe, you're bound to run out of ideas at a certain point. So I don't really blame her in that sense, but it was unfortunately a bit disappointing. <laughs> All of her books, especially her finales, are pretty formulaic. It always follows the same beats. Basically, there's like some major cliffhanger at the end of the previous book. Then we have to kind of resolve the romantic problems going on in the story. There's always some kind of big battle. They always enter a hell dimension. Always. That always happens. <laughs> they fight the big bad. There's a major character death. The main character almost dies. And then there's a happily ever after. In whatever order, you can switch those around. But that's every single Cassie Clare finale. Like every single one of them has exactly that formula. And I am not against formulaic stories and writing. I'm not at all. It's just when you've read the same formula happening over and over again in like all of these series and you were expecting like a little something different because she does always switch it up a little. There's always just like some variation. That's what keeps it interesting and what keeps you reading. This one wasn't different. Like this was basically all of those put together but just dulled down. And that was the overwhelming thought that I had after I'd finished it and why I felt so disappointed. <laughs> and in this case, I really do feel like the love triangle was just too dragged out. It was unnecessary in this story. She's done a love triangle in almost every single book she has had. And the only time it has ever worked for me is Will, Gem, and Tessa. And I feel like a lot of people would agree with me. And I just, I didn't need another love triangle in this story. And I knew it from the first book. Like it was very obvious that this is what was going to happen, but it could have gone in so many different directions. And yet we went in the most like basic direction it could have possibly gone. My other biggest gripe with this was that I really felt like Cordelia's character was completely underutilized. Like she truly spent this entire book just pining after James and then being a little bit indecisive about the whole Matthew situation and not really understanding her feelings which is all fine and like I know it makes me sound hypocritical because I literally just read these books because I want James and Cordelia to be together and be happy and like that's all I talk about the entire time but I do love the other components of the story and I like when the characters are fleshed out it's boring if the only thing they care about is their love interest that's why I like romance in fantasy so much more than just romance books but in this book I really felt like Cordelia's character was just kind of ruined in some ways not ruined but just not used the way she could have been. She really didn't do anything. She kills Tatiana, which was cool, but it was also really underwhelming. Like her death was kind of just brushed over really quickly. She's not even the one who saves everybody at the end. James really is the one who saves everybody and she saves James, but that's pretty much it. And she's supposed to be the main character. And I know that like we have multiple main characters. It's obviously an ensemble cast, but it really felt like James was the main character of the story over Cordelia. And don't get me wrong, I love James. I'm not upset that we got a lot of James in this book at all. I just wanted more Cordelia. I felt like we really didn't get much of her at all. There was very little between her and Lucy too. We don't even get to see their parabatai ceremony, which was so heartbreaking. And it really just felt, like I said earlier, so rushed by the end when it came to the characters' relationships outside of just James and Cordelia's romance and a little bit of her stuff with Matthew. We really did not get to see much of anything when it came to the other characters' relationships relationships with each other. I love all of them, like I've said, and I feel like I couldn't even talk about Thomas and Alistair very much because I didn't have that much to say. Because yeah, we got some like cute scenes and stuff between them, but I just wasn't as invested. But if we'd focused more on them, we would have had even less time for the non-existent plot. I really felt like this just needed to be another book. Like it should have been two more books for it to be fully fleshed out and for the plot to be fully fleshed out because it was just not there. <laughs> it was just all so anticlimactic and underwhelming to me and I wanted so much more out of this, so much more intense emotion and I felt like I didn't get any of that. And maybe this was me just like psyching myself out for the past several years thinking that this was going to be a devastating, heartbreaking book and she wanted to move away from people's expectations and do what people were not expecting and give everyone ultimately a very happy ending. Especially because it is like the conclusion to the prequel series and we just have the Wicked Powers left in the Shadowhunter Chronicles in total. And this is the final book for the Shadowhunters in the London Institute. So maybe that's why. But this book in a lot of ways kind of just felt like 
filler. Filler for the Wicked Powers, even though we didn't even get that much that's going to lead into the Wicked Powers, unless it really does tie into like a lot of things. Who knows? We'll have to wait until those books come out to see. But it felt like it was filler almost. And like she just kind of had to get this out of the way so she could move on to the Wicked Powers. And I felt like it deserved more. These characters deserved more. Cordelia as a character deserved more. I... <sighs> This is so hard for me. <laughs> I adore this series. I still adore this series. Okay, I'm always gonna love these books. I will 100% say without a doubt that The Infernal Devices is still my all-time favorite Cassandra Clare series. Like, that is the Shadowhunters series. If you don't read anything else, read those because that's it, god tier. But I still have loved so much about reading these books and despite the fact that this was disappointing, I did not hate it at all and I'm still very glad that I've read these and that I have these videos to look back on and that I got to share my experience of reading them with you all. But yes, I did have to be fully honest, live my truth because <sighs> It really, really, really hurts when the final book in one of your favorite series just does not live up to your expectations. And I haven't had that happen to me in a long time. And this one in particular, this hurt on a very, very personal level. <laughs> and trust me, it hurts me more than you know to not give this five stars. Like I was fully expecting this to be my favorite book of the year. It's probably gonna be my most disappointing book of the year, which is just, I'm more upset about the fact that I didn't love it than I am about what happens in the book, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think those were the things that I was kind of disappointed about in this book. I think that's the reason that it's brought the rating down for me and it's just left me feeling, I don't know, just a, a bit conflicted. <laughs> I still love James and Cordelia so much. They are still one of my all-time favorite fictional couples because, oh my god, <laughs> it was so satisfying once James and Cordelia finally just both confess to each other that they're in love and we have the entirety of I think chapter 23 I think that's what it was and it was just basically all just hair and daisy and I was living for it I loved every single relationship in this Anna and Ari were so wonderful I love that Ari's mom finally came around at the end and accepted her and they had their little moment fighting side by side also Thomas and Alistair uh, Alistair that boy literally grew on me so much I did not care about him in Chain of Gold. Like I was not that into him. I did not know how I felt about him. But like as the series has gone on, oh my god, he has grown on me so much. He's easily become one of my favorite characters. Having Cordelia, a Persian character in what is one of my all-time favorite series that I grew up reading ever since I was a little kid, to see a Persian character be one of the main characters of that story and someone that I also just relate to in a lot of ways has just been such an incredible experience for me. It's just meant so much to me to be able to see myself in a character in that specific way, see my ethnicity represented, to see the language represented in the book, to be able to understand what they're saying when they're speaking Farsi and recognize the foods and the mentions of artists and poets and stuff like that in Persian culture. It's just been such a joy for me and that's part of the reason why this series has been so special to me too personally. It's meant the world so I, I will forever treasure this series because of that. Like I said earlier, I really do feel like the epilogue of this book was Cassandra Clare atoning for her sins for putting us all through the Clockwork Princess epilogue because that was the saddest thing teenage me had ever experienced. And so I really think she was trying to go in the complete opposite direction with this epilogue. There were also a couple of nods to the Wicked Powers in the epilogue. There's specifically the line where Lucy is talking about how she wants to publish her first book and she wants to title it The Beautiful Cordelia and Secret Princess Lucy Defeat the Wicked Powers of Darkness and then Jessie suggests that she shorten the title and of course what would the shortened title of that be? The Wicked Powers? That was definitely a fun little nod to the next coming series and then like I mentioned also there was of course that whole scene with Jem and the reincarnation of Belial which definitely will come up again probably in the Wicked Powers. But yeah, I just can't believe it's over. And that was the last we're ever gonna see of these characters. The last we're ever gonna see of Will Herondale, which I... I don't want to think about it. <laughs> Honestly, finishing this has really just made me want to go back and reread The Infernal Devices. And I'm kind of thinking of doing that and maybe just making like a video series for each of the books in that series as well. And just doing like deep dive vlogs on them where we just like explain the entire plot of the Infernal Devices series. Just because I think that would be really fun. And also just because I really want to reread them because I will always love those books. But yeah, that's it for all my thoughts on Chain of Thorns, the final vlog in this series. 
these. It's been so much fun making these and I'm very sad that it's ending. <laughs> I literally spent like an hour the other day making a last hours Taylor's version playlist on Spotify. So I'm gonna go listen to that and cry now that I don't know what to do with myself because I, I'm just empty. <laughs> I'll leave it linked in the description box if you also want to listen. <laughs> Nonetheless, I hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed the whole series, both the books and my vlogs. I hope you had a good time reading this. I hope it didn't break your heart too much. But please let me know all of your thoughts on Chain of Thorns down below. There are definitely things that I missed in this one. If you would like to follow me on any of my social media, all of my links are in the description box as always. But thank you all so much for watching this video. Thank you for coming along with me on this journey reading these books over the past three years. I'm so grateful to all of you who've stuck around and all of you who have joined over the past few years. I love you very dearly and I will see you all in my next video. I feel so sad ending this one. I really, it really just feels like the end of an era. Oh, it's very bittersweet. Okay, I have to go before I start crying. I love you all. I will see you very soon in my next video. Goodbye.